Ready. Stephanie? We're good. Okay. Okay. Today is February 10th, 2021. This is the Norfolk Conservation Commission. We welcome you. Due to the COVID orders uh, from the governor, the meeting person has been uh, on pause for now, and we have public access to the Zoom meeting. So uh, please note that everything is recorded, video and audio. I ask any of the attendees that if you'd like to talk, just uh, raise your hand, and uh, either Stephanie or Rich will let you in. Okay, with that, the first item we have at 7 o'clock is the Keolis uh, Commuter Service. Request for determination. Janet? Um, Clary is here tonight, and yes. we got the plans yes. with the uh, wells shown on them. Yep. Oh, yes. Good evening. For the record, this is Clary Kutu. I'm from Keolis Commuter Services. Matt Donovan is with me um, tonight, and also Janice Kearney from MBTA. I think, um, Mr. Chairman, I think, Janet, if you can remind me what the pending matter was uh, related to the maps and that um, we were going to discuss those with the Board of Health, right? Um, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Mr. McCarthy for his significant amount of effort since December to get us all the information and also um, to Matt, uh, for all his effort to, to actually um, verify um, the information provided by Richard um, from the Board of Health and update the maps accordingly. So I, I guess the question is, um, Mr. Chairman, how do you wanna proceed? Do we go through the maps? Uh, what, what um, how do you wanna cover the next steps? If you okay, um, so we think the with the information we provided you, these maps should be up to date and accurate, correct? That is correct. Okay. Uh, Janet, do you want to talk about should we proceed on this tonight? Or but we okay, we just got the map on two A. So, um, we could postpone it to March, but there won't be a uh, penalty on you. Uh, and that gives everybody a time to uh, really look at the map and do our second guessing and pass it by Janet before we do the final approval for you. But I would think at that point, it's just it should be a rubber stamp if everything's accurate and we don't find anything else that might have been missed. But yeah, Rich did a nice job with us to uh, provide all the well information. So, Janet. Hi, I'm sorry. For me, David, you keep breaking up, so I've been having a hard time. Okay. Um, my thought is that these maps just came in. And I would, um, if the MBTA is all right with it, to continue this to the next meeting, just so, um, because we had residents along the rail line concerned about their well, just so yeah. they have a chance to look at these maps. Um, I had- They were posted, correct? I'm sorry? These have been posted on our website. If they did, we just got them, I think today or yesterday, one or the other. Yesterday, John. Yesterday, yeah. Right. Uh, Rich, did you post it on the website? I'm gonna check right now, I believe so. They oh, have been posted. Yeah. They have been posted. Okay. So uh, if we continue with March, 
Um, you know, at this point, um, we did receive the approved VMP, but we would like to finalize the process in March. Um, ideally, you would be getting right around this time, the yearly operating plan, which is actually being prepared and submitted to DAR. So um, you would have the opportunity um, to review these maps under a normal cycle, right? Yeah. Uh, so I think at this point, it's, it's not really, you know, a deterrent to, to, to us to move it to March, provided that we can um, close the hearing in March. Okay. All right. Um, then uh, let's, uh, any other commissioners have a comment question? Excuse me, Mr. Chair, is your video, the audio, something's wrong with your audio. We're not very hearing you very well. Yeah, I'm trying my best. I don't know what, what's going on with the computer tonight. Do, we, do any of the commissioners, I can, I can hear them a little bit. So do any okay, commissioners? Okay, Alex, is any better? A little bit. Okay. Um, can David do a refresh? On a PC, it's a F5. Might get his connection better. Thank you. F5? F5. Yeah. So Janet, I believe the changes were between milepost 24 and 25 and Matt can correct me if I'm wrong. So the maps that you're showing here are not the ones that were, yep, here we go. Right, we picked up, we got the four wells in that. Right. Zone. So maybe what I would like, Mr. Chairman, if you yeah. don't mind, maybe um, I would like Matt to go through the process of uh, how these were uh, verified uh, once okay. received the information with uh, from McCarthy. Okay. Uh, Is my microphone working any better? No. Somewhat. Better, Dave. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay. John, uh, do you want to explain it? The process. Matt. Oh man, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah, I was having a tough time understanding. Um, so yeah, the process was um, we got the we got all the private wells files from the Board of Health um, that would that would be in the proximity along the railroad um, that would be affected by the vegetation management that happens on the right of way every year. So um, we got that information and we narrowed it down. Um, the Board of Health had narrowed it down to all the all the properties that could be in reach and then i had narrowed it down to um, the actual wells that were in proximity and i went out and measured all of them with our um, gps device and we inputted it into arcgis and generated um, the distance from from the tracks um, and made the delineations based on that um, so currently the regulations allow you to spray um, every 24 months from 50 to 100 feet of a private well and you can't spray at all within 50 feet of a private well so that what that is depicted by the yellow and the dark blue zones that you see um, you don't see our original submission here but the only changes happen right here between 24 milepost 24 and 25 um, those spotted dark blue and yellow zones um, are a result of the changes of going out into the field and measuring um, these areas. Okay. And Matt, the, the 327 Main Street pot that's yellow, but there's light blue around it, is that because it's out of the 50 foot zone? Is there any reason why that's not dark blue as well? 
so that the light blue yeah the yellow zone there is the is caused by that well being there um, how many how many feet is that yellow zone in comparison a hundred feet by hundred feet or so that well in particular is is within the 50 feet it's actually 58 feet from the center of track but we gave it um we were a little on the more cautious side um from zero to 50 feet that would be a dark blue but because it's um and then 50 to 100 feet it would be a yellow sorry it's the opposite um the opposite yeah yeah from zero to 50 feet it would be yellow and we even though it's 58 feet we made it a yellow Okay. Uh, so we won't be spraying in that location. Right. Because of that well. my, que my question was basically that yellow square, what is that dimension actually? What is that in comparison to feet? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, in the field, it would be, it would be like, if you, if you took, put a tape measure on the well, it would be the diameter of the, of, the point across along the well um intersecting with the railroad so i can't tell you exactly how many feet and this is this map is so zoomed out um you'd have to go into the field okay okay but it, it will always keep that that required buffer um from the spray pattern to to the well okay well, i think we have the information we need to review it again and then uh, discuss it and end the hearing in March if uh, no other questions come up. But we'll continue to, uh, to correspond with you and all. And, you know, there's been a nice week of assistance from the party. So uh, I, with that, I will accept the motion. Mr. Chairman, before, before you... You move the motion. It is really important, Janet, maybe um, Mr. Chairman, that if any one person from the commission uh, would like to go out and take a look at these uh, field markings, we that in, in with enough time before we we have the next public meeting. Okay. So, so you know, I understand there are many questions, but um, if there is an interest to go and do a site visit, we would need to plan that and meet, need to make sure that we have enough time to coordinate that with our crews. Okay. Uh, thank you for the invitation. We will get back to you on that um, and take it up and coordinate with Janet and any members that would like to be out there. Thank you. So with that, uh, I will accept the motion. Continue your service request for you until March 10th at 7 o'clock. Alan Finney, so moved. Sure. Alex White Knight, second. Any discussion from the commissioners? Okay. Uh, any questions from the audience? Yeah, Eric Diamond has a question. Okay, Eric. Yeah, so the uh, the letter that was with the filing previously said there are no proposed changes to the existing maps and permanent markings in the field from the previous filing. Can you explain what the permanent markings are and uh, where we would find them? And is, would this letter be revised to, or is there some uh, update in the, the application that states there, there have been changes? Changes are um, defined when the um, commission issues a form two. Um, the application does not require us to change the letter um, in order for um, uh, for the board and the commission to approve at a later time what those changes have been. So when the board votes to adopt the changes that we've delineated in these maps, the form two will reflect those changes. Does that respond to your question? Uh, that's part of it. So what are the permanent markings and what do they look like and how would one see them? So, and is, so is there any way to see it in an large scale, like on a track chart at uh, a reasonable scale? 
So they would not be in the track charts, but they are physically along the tracks. And I believe because these were field verified recently, they most likely have paint. Matt can confirm that. We usually have um, um, a heavy poly um, plastic marker on the ties. Um, but since these were done recently, they most likely mark them on the tie or the rail with paint. So Matt, if you can confirm that. So I actually didn't foul the track um, because I was, I was going from door to door to actually get permission to go measure where the wells were. So I didn't, I wasn't allowed to step on the track. I'm, I'm trained to be on the railroad and um, I would have had to take the proper measures to get out there. Um, okay. But they, yeah, so Clary said um, it, the tracks are marked and in the vegetation management plan that was um, part of the filing, they they do go and confirm that those markings are in the field as denoted by the maps we provide you with. They make sure those markings are physically in the field before um, any any vegetation management activities do occur. And that's all part of the yearly operational plan that we provide you. Um, we'll notify the public via our website um, when the walk will be done on the track. Uh, for their so uh, by Monday, Tuesday, next week, I think, we will be back and get back to you and to the public and be ready to uh, walk the track. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I, I was not clear on, on your statement simply because you were a little bit cut off. Um, yeah. so, that we will notify the public when the walk will take place or the inspection of the track according to the map with um, your people. So, um, you know, we'll keep them informed. But uh, yeah, we'll have I, I can't understand anything. Sorry. Okay. I don't know what sense I need to You could try leaving the Zoom call and coming back in. The other thing, David, it, it might be your background. It interferes with the data transfer if you, you have some issues with the internet provider. It slows down and cuts off the um, voice. Yeah, um, unfortunately, I can't change it right now. <laughs> um, okay, uh, if you want to, David, did you want to try to log, um, exit and then come back in? Yeah, how do I? So just um, hit leave the meeting on the, we'll end. And then say leave the meeting. Oh, okay. Larry, if I might ask, would any of the public be also um, invited to do that walk as well with us if we do do it? The complication with COVID-19 has been really um, a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to limit the group if possible. Um, to just you know, um, less than a handful of people. And also I need to get people trained on RWP so they would need to take an online training. Um, so, you know, definitely it's, it's, it's manageable, but if it's a handful of people, it's easier. Okay, yeah. that's, that's yeah. why I'm asking. I was just curious if there's more to it than just going and walking out on the tracks. I right. Know. Well, the thing is, I, I anticipate this is a, a, a stretch uh, between 24 and 25. There's some access points for those particular uh, locations. So, um, you know, we can get creative, if you will, mm -hmm. instead yep. of going along the tracks and, and following the tracks and getting yeah. all of that. So, I, I mean, it's manageable. Okay. We just need to plan it. I would prefer that we have, you know, a small group of people, if you will. Yes. Um, okay. Well, yeah, well, my father said that's very low. Um, 
yeah, the smaller the better, as long as the information is confirmed and any other questions can be discussed and we'll have the information for the next meeting. Okay, can you hear me any better? A little bit. I okay. think I, before we leave, I wanted to make sure we, we're clear on the process um, that follows, right? So every year, the Board of Health, the Commission, the Board of Selectmen receive the yearly operating plan with the maps. And at that time, we will always ask the Commission, the Board of Selectmen, and the Board of Health to notify us of any new private wells. Okay. That's the process followed by um, DCR. So it is really important that any new wells in your community are communicated to DCR. Um, they are the ones who control and manage the repository. So with this change that we have, I think it's really important and maybe Richard, maybe you and I can exchange emails with Clayton so you have his information, but it's important that he receives the information of the private wells from the Board of Health so he can enter those into his registry. Does that make sense? You know, that makes sense. We, um, yes, we'll, we'll, we'll do that. And we did, so since this came forward, um, we actually have uh, revised the, the application for private wells now. Um, within it to let alert people to know that they do need to register the wells. Um, the Department of, what is it again? I'm sorry, Department of the Ag Agricultural Resources, right? Right, with DAR, yep. Yeah, yeah. Not DCR, I'm, I apologize. Yeah, yeah. Not DCR, DAR. No. Yeah. yeah. Um, as well as we did learn, obviously, for the rest on the call, you know, that it's not just applicable to the railroad right away. It's uh, railway right of ways, um, electrical um, lines through the town. So it's not just, um, you know, this was a more of an educational thing for us, I think, to realize that it, there's multiple right of ways that it applies to. So. Okay. Any other discussion? Okay, uh, we'll take a roll call to continue the Kielis, uh plan to um, March 10th at 7 o'clock. Roll call, Dave Silvery, aye. Alex Whiteside, aye. Fast on, aye. Al Finney, aye. Ed LaBurge, aye. And Jim Wilson, I. Okay, it passes. So we'll do the presentation next week and then we'll talk uh, by Zoom on the beginning of March on the 10th. Okay. And thank Janet, you very much. Thank, thank you. Very you. Much. And Janet, you can reach out to, to Matt to coordinate any site walk. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, 705. One from 113, 2021, so March. So I will accept the continuation of NOI 240, uh, 240, 0685, until uh, March 10th at 7 10. Hi, this is Fred. I'll, I'll move that we move the uh, hearing for NOI number 240-0635 to our March 10th meeting. At 710. At 710. I'll second. Okay. Is there any dis more discussion from the audience or commissioners? Okay, staying on, I will take the roll. Dave Surrey, aye. Alex Weissite, aye. Jim Molson, aye. Val Stone, aye. Callan Finney, aye. Fred LaBerge, aye. Okay, passes, and we'll notify them of the new uh, date. I need to 
that he did discuss about this, and he'll be prepared to be with us on March 10th. Okay, uh, seven times. We are at uh, 124 Seafront Street, NOI 240 um, we We did receive pest protection report just, you know, Mon Monday, Janet. Um, so the commission has a chance to review it. We need to do that before we proceed on this. And a uh, copy of the report, I understand, went to Ted O'Hara and to Christopher. I assume you did you get a copy? Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm having a little trouble hearing you, but I think you asked if I received a copy of the report. Yeah. Uh, we did. Um, and uh, it's at the pleasure of the uh, commission as to how they want to proceed this evening. We uh, haven't necessarily had a chance to at least give a preliminary presentation of the performance standards. Uh, and our engineer, Jim Pavlik from Outback, is here and available this evening. Uh, if you'd like us to give a presentation of the performance standards and and the uh, the overall plan as far as the commission's review, and then obviously um, you'll be reviewing Tetra Tech's peer review, and we'll have a chance to review it in the interim as well uh, and offer responses to the comments. And uh, you know we can continue with the next hearing, but I, I obviously up to you uh, as to what you'd like to do this evening. Uh, Janet, is that a good thing? Go ahead, I'm sorry. Did you say Janet? Janet, yes. Uh, just FYI, because I, I, if I'm not mistaken, the report came late yesterday after people were gone, so we got that this morning. I don't want you to think we got it ahead of time and weren't sharing, so we've all been kind of waiting for this report. I just wanted you to know that. Okay, should we have Lake Hills? Discuss the performance part of the project. I'm sorry, David. I'm having trouble. Did you want Mr. To Chairman, I, I think we've had a few uh, suggestions as to how to approve the audio. The only other one that might be an easy fix is if you use the phone dial in, the telephone dial in number, and just call in, and then we can hear you over the telephone line. I don't know if you want oh, to give that a try, but I have the number right here uh, up on my oh. screen. Okay. And then you can just turn off your, your computer microphone and we should be able to hear you, hear you loud and clear after that. Okay. Uh, Tell me when you want the number if you don't have it. Yeah, go ahead. 926 699 Uh, yes, that's the Zoom meeting call in that's on the invitation here. 926-699-9773. That doesn't work either. <laughs> no. You wow. you might uh, maybe you might need to enter the meeting the Zoom ID when you call in. I can't even get to the, that part. Oh, all right. Um, okay. Uh, you know, I don't know if that's the right number. Uh, there. Jim Wilson. Yes. Uh, why don't you take over the meeting? My communication isn't working. You want me to take over the meeting? Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, all right. So, um, I guess, Chris, um, you just got the Tetra Tech thing and haven't had a chance to review it. Um, the one thing I did notice um, in, in Tetra Tech's list, they didn't have the review from the DEP. They had notes from... Let's see, 1229.20 is when the DEP gave the, 
the filing for your um, number. So that's not in the TetraTech notes. Um, and the big, um, we could go over to Sean here. No, so what, uh, what we just I talked to David prior to the meeting since, you know, the report just came in to both the yeah. commissioners and the applicant that it probably didn't make sense to have him, him here tonight because you probably wouldn't be getting into really any substance of a review for tonight. And so he's not with you tonight. Um, just one thing, Chris, if you could go over with Sean, because I know you, it, to cut to the chase, we need to cover the DP's comment about um, the road actually going through the, the wetlands and they had suggested um, two cul-de-sacs instead and or the reason why you had to do it either way right. in your presentation. So right. Sean didn't yep. have that in his report. So I think it'd be of essence to maybe communicate to him or get him a copy of that. And so we yeah. speed on that part. To, so, so Sean, Sean did wait. point that out to Mr. Pavlik directly and he did have a conversation with him about that. So he is aware of that comment and we're absolutely prepared uh, to respond to that and, and okay. uh, highlight it in our uh, uh, peer review discussion about the limited project standards. So we can definitely answer that. And we, we do have our eye on it. I didn't uh, want so you to go through the whole thing and then we get to this point and we could go back to the drawing board that we're all up front at the beginning on everything right. that we have. So um, just in this period yep. of time that Sean's giving you the, the report based on all the data that he has. And I didn't want to go, you know, cause it looks like the state may want some feedback also on this. Yeah, I know he communicated that uh, directly to Mr. Pavlik. Uh, I thought I saw some mention of it in his report. Maybe it wasn't in there. It was communicated yeah, right. separately. He did, reference. and that's, that's where I got a little bit confused and wanted to, you know, kind of let's get on the same page because the state's saying it's an issue. He's saying it wasn't an issue, but he didn't refer to that report in the list of reports right. and documents that he used. Yep. So. I just wanted, you know, that to be, yeah. a, be clarifying for, you know, the sake of um, the citizens that are looking on and, and, you know, we don't want to have you make all these things. And then at the end we say, Oh, by the way, you spent too much doing these drafts and, you know, you, we, we're looking at cul-de-sacs versus a roadway and the effects on the habitat with either way. So. Right. Yeah. No. We'll we'll be able to establish the uh, limited project requirements once we once we dig into it, and I think uh, the board will get a good sense of how we will establish those. Yeah. There was. Yeah. Not to belabor the point. Yep. But you could, if you read his thing, that's kind of going back and forth to, um, and then we just need to get to the nitty gritty with you two ironing out kind of the differences, and you get an opportunity to look at you know, all the culvert changes and the field um, and yep. the BBW, interact, all of that stuff that right. he pointed right. out. So we could get So do you think Mr. Wilson uh, is sort of acting chairman while uh, Mr. Turry works on his, his phone? Um, and, and Mr. McCarthy, I don't know if you have another dial-in number that you can see there that was associated with that Zoom link. It's strange. Usually they give you a few numbers to dial into, but I don't know, Mr. Wilson, do you think it would be productive for Jim to give a, a presentation this evening uh, again on those issues or his, his design approach on the performance standards within the 100 foot buffer? Just uh, as, a, as a general matter and, and then you know we can dig into uh, the peer review comments at the next hearing. Entirely up to you and, and the board. I think it would be helpful to um, touch on this question that you've talked about already um, and get the board's input. And I, I know with Rich McCarthy here, he has a lot of history going back on the project in terms of uh, the layout of the site. And um, so if you'd like, Mr. Chairman, I could expand on this discussion and, and talk about the site in general. Um, it, it, it probably wouldn't be a bad idea to maybe go over the grading right now so we have an idea of what you're talking about so we can kind of look over it the next month um but i think the bigger thing right now is some of the um 
the water flow where it's where it's going to as it affects the BVW. Um, there was a comment. I mean, you can look at the comments. Um, if you want to just give a quick, maybe a quick preview of what your the actual layout of what you're saying it's going to be, because um, last meeting we had one where one of the homes was moved in the middle and. Um, some of the constituents in town didn't feel that that was something that was going to happen before that they thought that whole area was going to be left open. So maybe it wouldn't be a bad idea to give you an actual overview if you've got a, a more finalized plan of what you're trying to present before we get to um, Tetra Tech's um, peer review. Sure, no, I'd, I'd appreciate that. Okay. Um, is it possible that I could present a screen? Um, yeah, I'm not sure who has the controls. Yeah, so if it's easier, yeah, Jim, I can um, make a co-host. So. All right, thank you. Uh, I'd, I'd like to just give you a, a brief uh, overview, overview of the existing site. And um, I, only, I only did see that one dial-in number. Yeah, strange. So if it helps at all, I've sent David um, the email. I've sent him an email with the phone number and the access code. So if you have some opportunity, the, the phone number is going to be 929-205-6009. I'll repeat it. So it's 929-205-6009. Six zero nine nine. The meeting ID is going to be nine two six six nine 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 seven three three. Or sorry, nine seven seven three. We didn't get to introduce Stephanie earlier, so might as well now, right? So Stephanie Ackley is the uh, administrative assistant to the Conservation Commission, as well as the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, she is, uh, we welcomed her this week to uh, take um, and fill Amy's shoes with her retirement. So should have done that earlier in the meeting, sorry. But for those congratulations <laughs> to Amy on her retirement and yep. uh, welcome Stephanie. Yes. He's quite the Zoom expert, so we should be a good hand. <laughs> uh, so is David online now? Uh, I don't see him in yet. I hope everyone has seen the attorney that appeared in front of the judge with the cat face at this <laughs> point, because I am, <laughs> I am still belly laughing over that one. If that happens here, I am shutting down. Just so you know. <laughs> so that wasn't you, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Did that work? Close friend, maybe. Well, if you want, um, I mean, you could, you, you want to. I mean, David can hear you. So if you want to maybe start the presentation. Yeah, go for it, Jim. Yeah, okay. and then he can, we can get him can in. watch the tape later also. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to run you through the existing conditions and then an overview of the proposed development and get into a little more detail about the um, road crossing area and the other portions of the project within the commission's jurisdiction. So I'm hoping if I share screen, um, can everyone see this? The existing conditions, Lakeland Hills? Yep. Okay, yes. good. So this is uh, the site, it's about 22 acres. It's an L-shaped site at 144 Seekonk Street. And um, it's this, uh, entrance area off of Seekonk Street here on the uh, west side of the site. There's a bunch of um, 
residential homes on about three acre lots, three to five acre lots along Seekonk Street and other uh, properties towards the east. Um, so on this 22 acre site, there's this green um, wetland area. This is a, was identified under the DEP's superseding order of resource area delineation that was issued in July, 2018. So we've taken that, um, that ordering vegetated wetland line and shown it on the site here. There's also a smaller isolated vegetated wetland. Um, if you can see where I'm pointing to um, in the central portion of the site. Uh, that would be non-jurisdictional under the Wetlands Protection Act. And as the commission is no doubt aware, we have filed this under the State Wetland Protection Act, not the local bylaw, and, uh, where it's a 40B development. And so um, the other significant features I'd like to point out here um, is that there's essentially a drainage divide. This is this offsite area to the west is a, a hill that runs um, to the north to provide a drainage divide. So um, if you can see where I'm pointing with the pointer, um, that's about the drainage divide where portions of the site to the west flow toward Seekonk Street and portions of the site to the east of this ridge flow towards this wetland area and other areas off site. Um, so that's a significant site feature. Um, and generally this wetland is flowing towards the east off site towards the Stop River. Um, so that's the, the general um, layout of the existing conditions. And this is the proposed development. And I'm showing it on these uh, single sheets just because um, the actual set of plans that we submitted breaks the site up into um, three sheets showing all of this information. So I can zoom in on any of these areas if you'd like, but um, so this is the proposed development. Uh, we have an entrance road coming off of Seekonk Street that then uh, loops around the back end of the site. Um, there is one wetland crossing for this proposed roadway. And we'll talk more about that. But uh, just generally the layout. Um, again, there's 16 single family homes on the north side of the site here. Um, that includes these four here and 12 on the outside. And then to the south, there's two condominium parcels uh, containing eight duplex homes uh, on the inside of the loop. And there's another 20 on the outside of the loop. And so again, under their Wetland Protection Act, the commission would have jurisdiction over the hundred over, over any work within the hundred foot buffer zone, which is shown on this plan and I'll, I'll zoom in on it. Um, okay. Um, trying to pan to the left. Um, all right, well, um, I'm zoomed in a little bit. Can you see the 100 foot buffer zone line here? That's this outer green line. It's rather faint, mm -hmm. but um, that's the uh, 100 foot buffer zone. And within that area, we're proposing two stormwater basins. Um, there's this roadway crossing here 
Um, and then there's a portion of the roadway on the left side that's within the 100 foot buffer zone. We took care to grade that area to avoid any um, wetland alteration. This is that isolated vegetated wetland right here. So we're, we're proposing grading to avoid that, any disturbance to that. And then otherwise we have just two buildings in the project are gonna be located within the 100 foot buffer zone, but outside the 50 foot buffer zone. So that's this uh, duplex here and this duplex here. And there's two proposed um, septic systems that are also partially within the 100 foot buffer zone, but in compliance with the um, state's Title V um, requirements for uh, siting the septic system. So it's at least 50 feet away from the, the wetlands. And um, that's the majority of the features in that area. And then to the south, um, there's another off-site bordering vegetated wetland area with a hundred foot buffer zone also. And we're proposing to stay out of out of that buffer zone with the location of this drainage basin. So that, that work is outside the buffer zone um, to the southern wetland. So as regards the uh, DEP's comments and the question about um, is it a limited project or not? Um, and that's where I was hoping to potentially um, uh, get clarification from the commission because there's, there's two ways to go about this. We can either file under 1053, 310 CMR 1053, which is the limited project um, regulations. And under that, it's the requirement is that the applicant is seeking to gain access to upland area by crossing a wetland. So that's what we filed under with the thought that um, this looped road was necessary for traffic safety, um, emergency vehicles, etc. So that was my understanding as to um, the reason for the crossing. And um, so again, there's two ways to go about it. We can either file under 1053 for the limited project status, or we could file uh, directly under 310 CMR 1055-4, which is the bordering vegetated wetland crossing requirements. And under those general performance standards, we could, the, the project also complies. Um, that allows for any wetland alteration of less than 5,000 square feet could be approved by the commission uh, so long as we replicate it. And that is proposed right in this area here. This is the replication area. So the crossing involves Need to get my statistics here. Um, all right, the crossing is um, going to alter 1,253 square feet of BVW. So we're well under the 5,000 square foot threshold. And we're proposing to alter, uh, to uh, replicate um, in excess of a one to one requirement of 1,354 square feet. And um, so that's that's the one of the questions for the commission, I guess. Should we be filing under 1053 as a, the limited project status, or should we um, file it as um, uh, just altering less than 5,000 square feet under 1055? And um, hey, this is Fred Laberge. I have a question, if I may. Sure. If you were to re if you were to replicate that wetlands, where would that be? To the north of the area that's delineated there, or where? Yeah, it's it's right here. 
Um, this is the wetland crossing right here, the, with the heavy line. That's yeah. a proposed culvert to okay. maintain drainage flow through there. And then we have uh, this uh, rectangular shaped area that would be the replication. That's what we're proposing. Okay, thanks. Um, I do, um, that's exactly what you just said, is exactly what the DEP mentioned, the, the two different ways to file and the information that would need, they would need and be required and what we would need to file under either one. So I think what would be great is if we get Tetra Tech involved to try to go through the project because um, I think one of their notes is the, the increased amount of, um, you know, going from a forested area to either grass or hard pavement, how that's gonna affect the um, BBW that's in place now so that it doesn't go underwater and get damaged. And then the BBW south of the project also. So, and I think that was with their, their comments, if you, it's kind of hard because they, they had some specific comments about the certain basins and um, you know, water flows and how that, that whole thing was gonna come into play. Sure, so we know we have to work through the comments with uh, uh, Tetra Tech. And um, I, I guess I was just looking for confirmation that uh, you know, the road layout is what it is and um, it's, it's been through many iterations, as you know, with the zoning board. And it's my understanding, this is the minimum road that's necessary to satisfy the, the other town requirements. Um, yeah, so along those lines, Jim, that the, the limited project standards is, I believe, uh, where we were gonna review that with Tetra Tech and make sure that uh, we can vet the requirement that the road be oriented in this manner uh, so that we essentially have two access points and we can qualify in, in that sense. And uh, to Mr. Wilson's point, we'll, we'll address that uh, in, our, in our peer review comments specifically to make the distinction. But yeah, Jim, the, the road layout is the uh, uh, mandated layout from the zoning board after the result from that process. So um, that's, what, that's what we're basing it off of. Okay. So that's what we're going to have to wait to get through Tetra Tech, and um, you know, in all fairness, we paid or you paid. I'm sorry for the peer review to make sure that um, you know every, everything's you know up to par, so we don't have any issues you know going down the road with with any of the design. Okay. Can I make a point? Yeah. So I think. Um, Jim, are you done with your presentation? Um, yeah, that's the, that's the gist of it. As you know, the, the submittal included a lot of other documents from the drainage report in compliance with the DEP stormwater management. We have a draft stormwater pollution prevention plan and erosion control plans. And, the, the, you know, so there's, there's, it's a complete filing and uh, as much detail as you want to get into right now, I'm happy to answer questions or, or how no, you I think like to proceed. The, Look, I think we've probably beat a dead horse. We need to get okay. Tetra Tech to look at what you have um, and compare it to their, what they looked at, what the state suggested, um, you know, confirm with the zoning board on, you know, two cul-de-sacs versus reaching the, the wetland area also. So, um, you know, we've got, we've got all of that. So. Jim, can I make a point, please? Sure. Um, when you, and this, this is my take as far as the limited or, or um, BBWs. Um, and Bish is familiar with 106, 108, and that was a limited project because they had to, to access the property, they had to cross the stream to get to the upland to do their building. Um, I personally just think it's better to just do it under the BBW, you're under the 5,000, so you're not triggering, triggering anything obscene per se. Um, I don't want people hung up, you know, it's, it's normally limited project, you have to alter a wetland to get it 
up here. That's not the case here. Um, I don't personally have a problem. I prefer it personally to go under the BBW, but I want people aware because I don't, I don't want to say he never said anything. Um, one of my concerns is people, and it depends the time of year that you're there, but down below that, right behind Fred LeBurr, so you can't see, but my opinion is at the bottom of that wetland, that's like an intermittent stream that's outflow. So hence the switching it from the culvert pipes to an open box culvert to let that flow through or creatures or whatever. But that, I've seen that, and I, I do think, I think Mr. O'Hart's seen it. And, you know, you've got the, you can see the washout on these boulders that go down the hill. So it's just making sure, you know, my thought is, you know, that open culvert street crossing standard, just so whatever water is coming through can go through. Um, so that's, you know, BBW go under, um, alteration and revocation for BBW, but please look at that because if that's not done properly, that water is going to back up and you don't want it messing up your development that you're trying or any of your basements or anything. So that's just something I hope people will look at. Please. Yeah, those are two very helpful comments, Janet, uh, at the outset. Um, I do think uh, we're, we're going to, uh, as far as the analysis end up, Proceeding, and again, we're going to vet it again with Tetra Tech. But um, as far as the limited project standards, uh, there's an element of this that requires the two access points to reach this area. So there's a safety consideration there. And I understand, you know, ordinarily, uh, you could say, well, it's you don't really need that second point. But our our uh, uh, takeaway from the design process before the zoning board is that that second point of access uh, to make the loop is, is part of the, the safety regime, being able to have circular traffic flow throughout and, and not one access point uh, to those townhouses. So we'll, we'll vet that more with Tetra Tech. And then on the open box culvert uh, versus closed box, I think that there were some trade-offs that, that Jim had to make in the design. And, and again, we'll, we'll vet this further uh, with Tetra Tech, but if we go with the open box design, um, it may require some additional installation of, um, of retaining walls and additional structures to make that work from an engineering perspective. So rather than uh, go, go that retaining wall route, we felt it was less invasive, again, from an engineering perspective. But those are, those are two very helpful comments. And I think, uh, you know, T Tetra Tech, I uh, had a con uh, conversation with Jim as well on those two points. So we'll be prepared to discuss those in depth at the next hearing. But I, I think it was helpful to highlight those going into it. Very good. Do any of the other members have any questions? Then I guess, Rich, we could open it up to um, anybody that's in the meeting that would like, like to make a comment. Do we have anyone? Let's see. Anyone like to say anything? And I guess if not, then maybe we do. We just um, make a motion to continue the meeting until uh, March 10th at 7:15. Yeah, the one comment I would have too, as we go through this, is to. Uh, you know, we want to coordinate with DPW too on that design because this 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 is will become a public way. Um, that's correct, Chris. And this one is yeah, the, just the uh, uh, the loop road, road itself. Yeah, road though. Yeah. So okay. If if I could just oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. I was just going to ask procedurally. Um, is the commission expecting we'll uh, respond to Tetra Tech's comments and then resubmit a set of plans that they would then review again prior to the next meeting? Or how is that going to play out? I'm just thinking time-wise in terms of us addressing the comments and, and then providing 
adequate time for them to review it again uh, before the next meeting. Uh, it, it may be worthwhile. The work with Sean, the quicker we'll go. So I mean, if I would maybe um, the easiest thing to do is get the plans together after talking to Sean about exactly what his issues are. And so you have them to present at the next meeting. Um, we're, I'll be honest, we're, whenever we've had a project that's had an issue with delayed, it's because we've had the peer review and then the applicant decided that that's not the way they wanted it. And it ends up just holding everything back because then, we, you know, it's out of, in, within a buffer zone or something like that. And, you know, flags are missed and those type of small things on a plan will hold it back to the next meeting before we can issue um, anything. But at this point, so I have a, Jim, uh, I, have a, I have a process question. Before we can review it, right, Richard? Uh, yeah, Jim and uh, David and uh, Janet. Um, from a process standpoint, if Tetra Tech communicated with uh, Outback back and forth and through Janet between both means, would, that, would the commission be okay with that? So it's not, there's a dynamic back and forth yeah, no, I mean, it's, I, I think the better, like I, I think what I was trying to say, Richard, the better they all work together, the quicker this thing goes. Okay. I just want to be, I just want to make sure process wise that the commission's fine with doing that. So. Yeah, because when, when they haven't, and it's been a back and forth with no real working um, rapport, it's the applicant makes the changes and then the peer review says, well, they missed two things, and then we're back to the next meeting for the other two changes. So, it, so my suggestion would be then you probably would want to go to March and then and see where you're at as far as the review process goes and whether you're prepared to get into deeper depth of the review or not, right? Yes, because we don't even, under, I mean, to be honest, we, one of the big things, and I think some of the people watching are going to have is the loop versus the non loop. And is this a safety issue? Is this, you know, better? What is better for, mm -hmm. you know, the wetlands in that area? And I think those are questions we need to have answered also. And those are the kind of the big things that, you know, I think we're all kind of thinking about when it comes to a wetland crossing. And that's the way the board's been on other crossings also. So, Okay. Uh, it just, you know, Karen Clark, the one I see your hand up for questions. Um, yes, just a couple of quick questions for the board. Um, did the original set of plans, the 44 unit, I shouldn't say the original, but the 44 unit set of plans that was presented to the ZBA and for which the um, comprehensive permit was issued to the developer. Did that set of plans violate the Wetland Protection Act? Mr. And the Chairman, reason I, do you want me to answer that question? Yes, that's fine, Chris. Uh, Ms. Clark, those plans did not approve anything with respect to wetlands. That's why we're here. So we need to get a permit from this board. The zoning board did not authorize us to do anything with respect to wetlands. They issued a preliminary permit that said from an overall design standard, this is what we're willing to approve from the town's perspective relative to local regulations. They, they, they did not and they don't have the authority to approve a plan that violates the Wetlands Protection Act which is why we're before this board. So this board is going to determine whether or not we comply with either the limited project standards, which we believe we do, or the 5,000 square foot allowance for alteration of BVW. We believe this qualifies as a limited project that will be peer reviewed, vetted, determined by this board. And we ultimately need to get a permit from this board that allows us to move forward under the Wetlands Protection Act. So the answer to your question is no, for several reasons, but most importantly, the zoning board doesn't have that authority. 
Well, let me ask you this, Attorney Agostino. Did the developer and landowner ever research the possibility of the original plan passing or falling within the guidelines of the Wetlands Protection Act? Absolutely, absolutely. So we knew we were proposing a wetland crossing, which was shown on the plans from the get-go. And we knew that we needed to qualify the wetlands crossing as a limited project or a 5,000 square foot alteration issue. But we feel it will ultimately pass muster uh, as a limited project. So that's, that's what we're here to vet. We, of course, we thought of that. We knew we were crossing wetlands. That's, the, that's, that's part of the design process. So I guess that leads me to my next question. Why were condominium units placed where drain basins once existed and homes moved from the right side of the project over to the left side of the project where there was originally a culvert because of wetland delineation? Okay, so that's where we're gonna, uh, I'm gonna defer back to the board because we've, we've already had two hearings where we've discussed differences between what was presented at the zoning board and what is being asked of this board to issue an order of conditions for. So we, we really can't, all those questions are, are fodder for further discussion before the zoning board if we get an order of conditions from this board, but we're going back to, again, the 100 foot buffer around the wetland and the performance standards and meeting those performance standards of the Wetlands Protection Act. That's the limited jurisdiction of this board. So if there's a particular performance standard that's of concern, uh, you know, we'll, and, and you wanna articulate that in a question to the, to the peer review engineer or to the Conservation Commission, I think that's appropriate. Uh, but just continuing to talk about plan changes from what was presented as, again, a schematic preliminary plan subject to conditions at the zoning board versus what we're applying for here, then that, that type of questioning should be reserved for the zoning board. Well, I guess where I'm confused is if you read the conditions of the comprehensive permit, number one states the final comprehensive site plans will ensure such plans are consistent with the 44 unit plan dated 331 2020, which that's not this plan, it's a different plan, and presented to the ZBA on 41 2020. So the plans we're looking at tonight are very different than the plans that were presented to the ZBA and the plans on which the comprehensive permit was issued. And also within that comprehensive permit, it states that any changes to the plans that were presented to the ZBA should be minor in significance. So my concern obviously is if the original plan does not infringe upon the wetlands, why isn't the original plan being examined and used? I, I, I'm not following that question. I'm really not because that, that goes back to uh, this issue of what was shown on the original plan versus this plan. This hearing is only about performance standards under the Wetlands Protection Act. And, and I think I'll defer back to the chair. Uh, and and Ms. Clark, I've, I've invited you to call me to discuss any of these concerns several times. And I think uh, the commission has uh, a hearing to discuss this plan as it exists under the Wetlands Protection Act, uh, but concerns about uh, how the plan has changed, again, either reserved for the ZBA hearing, if we get back there or when we get back there, or please call me and I can describe to you in detail how this works. I appreciate that, um, I do. However, regardless of what you explained to me, it really depends on 
what my town boards, what their decisions are. So I, I guess I'd like to hear from the Conservation Commission as to why plans that were submitted for this comprehensive permit are now very different than what we look at today. And why weren't those plans vetted first for analysis of whether or not they abided by the Wetlands Protection Act? Because now we have four condominium units and two septic systems that are going to go into possibly contaminate a very delicate area of wetlands that potentially could include a, a vernal pool. And I believe the setback for a vernal pool is 200 feet state regulations. So obviously as an abutter and somebody who has a well for my drinking water and for the amount of animals that use that property, um, I'm very concerned about permitting this project to infringe within 50 feet of our wetlands. And, and I think the board, the Conservation Commission does have some authority over whether or not they will permit any kind of variation from the comp comprehensive permit. I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, please. All right, so the plan that is in front of us is the only plan that we have authority on the Conservation Commission to review. They've given us, this is the first we've seen of the plan. Um, the plan has gone to TetraTech, who we hire as a peer reviewer and the applicant pays for. The, the peer reviewer looks at the layout of the buildings in relations to the wetlands. The wetlands in this case are, correct me if I'm wrong, um, Chris, we're talking about, Janet, um, an intermittent stream. Um, because the vernal pool is a is more of a um, local jurisdiction, not a state jurisdiction. So under this project, because it's a 40B, we are under the state um, jurisdiction for wetlands, not the local jurisdiction for wetlands. And that's just the way the 40Bs go. And that's why we have the discussion about the two type of ways that they're petitioning two types of ways to use to cross the wetland area is because that's what's allowed by the state, not what's allowed by the local ordinance. So um, whatever goes through the ZBA, um, whatever comes to us is what we look at and only can look at. Unfortunately, right now for us, um, Chris knows this is just like scratching on a piece of paper right now till we get the peer review done and um, Sean from Tetra Tech and Jim look at look at the plan and and come up with the issues that Tetra Tech has brought up with the, the different basins, where they're located, how they affect BBW, um, that whole entire thing. So that whole entire report um, has, as Chris said, you, I, you probably slump in your chair when you get the report from Tetra Tech, because it's it's a lot of a lot of questions, a lot of work. They question a lot of where the culvert sizes, crossings. Um, they want to know the effects of BBW. They want to know more about the drainage and runoff data um, for the different storm sizes and how that's going to affect um, a BBW downrange. Because when you go from a wooded area to grass you gain 15% more um, runoff. And when you go to solid surface, it's 100%. So all the areas that now contain um, unpenetratable surfaces are now have to be calculated as to how they're gonna affect the BVW. Um, so all of that needs to be looked at before we can get to the next step of even finalizing this type of plan. Because for instance, if they determine that the, the ground, the above water storage areas are not big enough and they need to take out a condominium unit to compensate for that, then that may be something that's done. Or they may have to move them and move some houses around again. 
we won't know that until Tetra Tech and the engineer get together and, and look at the issues that the peer review has. And once that comes down, then um, we'll get another map that may be slightly different from this or maybe a lot different from this. It all depends on how the peer review comes out. And so right now we're, we're sort of at the beginning stages of seeing what we need to do and, and get an idea of what our next steps are. So that's why we're not, we're not looking at this and not batting an eyebrow or not taking this seriously as a commission. We take it very seriously as Chris would begin to say that, yeah, we've had our issues together, but um, we're honest up front. He knows what we expect. Um, we've never hidden from that. Um, we're gonna follow the rules um, to a T at least for what the state requires us to do for this, um, this wetland area. So um, I think the best thing for this is next meeting we'll have for the public, Chris, probably a little better idea of where we stand. And, and then you could you know maybe talk a little bit more and Sean will be here. We'll get a little bit more open discussion um, about from more a more technical point of view um, between the engineers of why the houses are in different spots and why the drainage areas are in certain spots and why the leach areas have to be where they are and why they can perform um, that close to a wetland area based on the soil type and the percolation of the leach field based on the size of the homes around it. Um, so those are the type of things that, you know, that have come up in these meetings that um, people are looking for answers. And as you know, you, you're more likely to hear from engineers in these hearings than lawyers. So I would obviously prefer to do less speaking, <laughs> let the engineers do their thing. Uh, but I'm just here to sort of act as, uh, uh, to provide some continuity between all the other hearings that we've had. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll serve in that role, but I really want uh, Jim to, take the lead and, and discuss the technical issues with Sean and, and Janet and, you know, the members of the commission that uh, this is their expertise. So we'll just leave it at that and um, hopefully come back with uh, the answers to the peer review and, and a good solid presentation from the engineers next, uh, next hearing. Um, do we have, Rich, is anyone else ready to ask? Uh, another question? John Driscoll? Yeah, um, just sorry, I'm a little late to the meeting, but um, was able to do a cursory review of the, the Tetra Tech report from February 9th. Um, it, it, it does look like there are an abundance of concerns and, and um, that, that a lot of the adjustments made with this plan are kind of pushed right to the edge. And um, I'm not really looking for a response on this, but did want to voice some concerns that uh, since based off of the, the Gardner report from August 8th of 2019, which showed uh, possible alleged wetland violations already. I do have concerns that um, just, again, a cursory reading of the Tetra Tech, that there's not a lot of margin for error or miscalculation with this, with the, uh, the, the crossing and the other mitigations of, of wetlands that are taking place. So that's a good question. The, the list that we got from Tetra Tech is probably about a normal list for even a regular sized property. Um, there's always concerns with uh, runoff rates. Um, even we had a project um, to put in um, uh, solar panels and they had to come back a couple of times because it was um, runoff rates, um, catch basin sizes, um, vegetation type, when to mow, all that type of stuff. So um, this, it, as it may look like a lot of stuff, it's, it's about a little bit more than a normal project, but it's very typical for a project to have that many issues or concerns, or from Tetra Tech's point of view, the peer reviewer wants just clarification of answers and calculations, not just what's drawn on, so. No, and, and I, I completely understand that. They wouldn't be, be, be earning their dollar if they weren't uh, raising every, every possible concern that could be there. Um, like I said, my, my, my focus is, is with regards to, to possible alleged violations that had already happened in the past. 
and, and these numbers that seem to be pressing the line. And it's, again, it's, it's more a, a comment for, for the, the Conservation Commission um, when, when looking at this that, that uh, again, there doesn't seem to be a lot of margin of error. No, I agree with you, but that's, um, you know, I can't really, it wouldn't be fair for Chris or I to go back on meetings and executive sessions that we've had over the last couple of years on any subjects on this. We're looking, what is fair to everyone is just to spend our due diligence on what we have in front of us today, what, what the actual plan that we're gonna be getting next month and making sure that the issues that Tetra Tech has put forward for everyone are all addressed. And the commission, I can tell you, um, as you can tell, I was versed, not ready to be the chairman, but versed on reading all of this. I'm we're all fully aware of the different versions that um, they could use to, to cross um, the wetland areas, but it's their position and their job to explain to us why. And, and for Tetra Tech um, to come back and explain that this indeed is the only way that's possible. Uh, and then to go over each and every one of the concerns. And then, if, you know, we've had issues where, you know, we've told people no. And we, if, if we have, if the water basins aren't big enough, they're not big enough and they have to be moved. And like, but right now it's too early to guess what exactly is gonna happen because we got to look at all the, the peer review as a whole as to how it affects the different parts of the project. Because once you move, even it may seem simple, well, we want to catch more water and move a catch basin. Well, it's not just that simple because you still have other areas that are going to be affected just as, as greatly by moving things like that. Oh, I, I completely agree that it's not that simple. I don't think any of it's simple. And, and that's why that's why I raise the concerns with regards to, to you know, replacement zones and stuff like that seem to be, you know, within a couple percents of what the required replacements, because exactly as you said, a minor adjustment can have a major impact. So, you know, that those, you know, some of these concerns that 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 Tetra has, has brings up, you know, a lot of stuff that they think it, you know, they consider it appropriate provided that. And and as you mentioned, you know, small changes can have major impact. So are those small changes going to provide that the crossing is designed in a manner that minimizes associated impact? And again, I can't harp enough on, on previous impacts in violation that it, that had allegedly happened based off of the previous report from, from last year, or from two years ago. Okay. I I, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to beat a dead horse here, it's, but it's, you know, it's, they, they kind of co correlate, you know, two years apart, similar types of concerns. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Um, so I... Dr. Carpenter? Yeah, hi, thank you. Uh, I appreciate what you guys are doing with the Conservation Commission and wetlands. And, and I just, just one comment and um, I realize this meeting is strictly, strictly has to do with conservation, but it just appears to me looking, kind of watching this over the last year or, or more, that this whole organization has done things backwards. I would assume that if I were trying to develop an area, I would address the wetlands and these things first, then address that they fit into what I'm, what I'm trying to do as far as, as buildings go. That makes me concerned about that organization. Uh, and that's, that's my comment. Uh, and it, it's, it's the way I'm looking at it. Uh, just, I can say it looks ass backwards or putting the cart before the horse or whatever you want to call it. But that's, it, it, it doesn't, doesn't seem like it flows the way it should. Um, I, you know, I, I've never built a big organization like that, but I've built homes. Uh, I built, I built a, Full hosp veterinary hospital. Uh, I was a contractor, and I learned what went first, what goes first before something else, and follow that follow that direction. Uh, it just doesn't appear like this organization, uh, Lakeland Hills, is is going that way. My comment. All right. Um, do we have anyone else? 
Karen Clark, is this a new question or is this, you didn't put your hand down? Um, yes, just a quick question for, uh, for Janet DeLonga. At the last meeting, Janet, you mentioned that the Conservation Commission um, would visit the site once again because the waters tend to flow in the months of March, April, May. Um, so my question is, is does the Conservation Commission intend to inspect the area uh, when this, once the snow is gone and, and the waters are flowing again? First of all, um, I apologize, but I don't remember saying that. Um, I think when it came up about site visit, David Turi had said we were gonna wait and see and let things go a little further along. Um, I don't know if the conservation members are gonna wanna go out there. So, um, I don't even know which members were ever there before. So you have new members. So it's always an option to go look at the site they might first of all want it when there's not two feet of snow, you can see stuff, but also a little bit better plan. So when you go out there, you can say, oh, this is the area they were talking about. And we usually have somebody go with us so they can say, this is the area we're thinking for the base and there, the whatever's there. So, you know, hopefully that will come. I just don't, right now I've got enough snow in my yard. I don't need to go see someone else's snow. And that doesn't give you that lay of the land and what's out there and underneath. And even for wetlands, this isn't a good time. You know, you usually like like your yard, you're talking, say, April on. So um, let's wait and see how this goes along. I would love to go back out there just um, to see it again and, and trying to figure out where they're gonna put the roads and everything else and see how that looks. But we'll see how this all plays out. Okay, thank you. I appreciate it. And just one last comment. I, I hope the, the board understands where my reservations come from and some of my, my neighbors. Um, Attorney Augustino originally made a promise to keep that area within the loop road um, in its natural state. And at the time he presented it to the ZBA, and, and this is all on tape, um, he was, he was, he made sure that he pointed to a map showing that, that open area inside the loop road. And he had decreased his development from 84 units to 44 units and made a point of telling all the ZBA members and those residents that were watching or have since watched the, the tape that they had doubled the open space from 3.3 acres to 6.6 .6 acres and stated that that area would remain untouched. So that's, you know, that's a tough, tough pill to swallow now for the residents that listened to that kind of promise. And now we're being told that that area now, that that very precious wetland area is being squeezed by condominiums and drain basins and decreased in size from the promised 6.6 .6 acres. So I'm not trying to be argumentative with anybody. I just want to give you a background as to where, um, where a lot of us have um, issues with what's been presented versus what is being presented now. That's all, thank you. Okay, do we have anybody else with any other questions or concerns? Uh, you do, Sylvana? Yes, I just want to not rehash what others have already comment on, commented on, but I just wish to concur on the concerns that Karen Clark, Dr. Car uh, Carpenter, and Mr. Driscoll have brought up. Um, I, I have the same reservations, I have the same concerns, and I hope that the commission treads, you know, approaches the, the requests with the reservations in mind but from all of us. And again, I don't wish to rehash and repeat the same concerns that the people have stated already, but I just want to impress my concerns as well, that they match 
the people that have already commented. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do we have any other any other comments or questions? If we don't, then we could uh, move the hearing to March 10th. What would be a good time, Janet? Seven to, we have one at 7.10. Do we want to go to 7.15? I guess 715 going once. All right, if somebody wants to make a motion for 715, I will continue this meeting for Seekonk String 240-0638 to 720 on the, on March 10th. Alan Finney, I'll make a motion so moved. Fred LeBurr, second. Okay, take a roll call. Jim Olson, aye. Valstone, aye. David's raising his hand. Al Finney, aye. Fred LaBurge, aye. Okay. Motion passes. Um, and we'll see everyone uh, next month. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. thank you guys for your time. And thank you for all that added their comments. Um, the next thing... Uh, we have the minutes. Did anyone have any issue with the January 13 minutes? Yeah, I did. Uh oh, okay. <laughs> Come on, guys, I read this stuff. All right, if you have them in front of you, um, the third line down from the beginning, because it's this is the January 13th minute, but it says the November 4th, 2020. So that should be changed to January 13th. See, relating to 2020 novel, novel coronavirus outbreak emergency, the November 4th, 2020 public meeting, but it's the January 13th meeting. Okay. In the first paragraph, third type line. Hello, you got your minutes? Yeah. Yeah. Good. <laughs> okay. Okay, good, that's number one. Now go further down, about two thirds down on that page, 10 Valentine Drive. What was it? 10 Valentine Drive. Yep. Okay, present was Karen Nickerson, N-I-C-K-E-R-S-O-N. -S okay. Okay, bottom of the page on all the pages, Conservation Commission, it says December 9th, 2020. It's January 13th. Okay. Good. And then on page five, under new old business, 16 Valentine Drive enforcement order. The, the third sentence, the second line down, Ms. DeLonga has spoken to Joyce Hastings. It was Mr. Chapman. We talked to Joyce. That Chapman, Chapman. Okay. Okay. And that's it. All right. So, thank you. Hey, guess what, Stephanie? Looks like those are the first minutes you get to adjust. <laughs> Thanks. I have I have those revisions. Thanks, Jim. You know where her desk is, right? I know where to find her. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I can't believe I missed all that. <laughs> All right. Um, we, Richard, was there a reason that the December 9th minutes are on here? They just need to be signed? Those were already done. You've signed those. It was, it was less, you know, less than we just use the old agenda to update the new one, and that should have been crossed okay. off. That you can already we just, signed those. Was we just, now, can we approve? We, just need to make a motion to uh, accept the minutes for the January 13th, 2021 with the notes as stated from Janet. As yeah. amended. As yeah. amended. Do I have a second? Al Finney seconded. Okay. We'll take a roll call. Jim Wilson, aye. 
Al Stone, David aye. Davis raising his thumb. Al Finney, aye. Fred LaBurish, aye. The, okay, so we can move on. We don't really need to do anything with the, the double track report. No, but if you go up above that, the 2020 Norfolk Conservation Commission yeah. annual report, we've got to get that done tonight because we got to deliver that tomorrow up to the selectman's office. Okay. So what do we need to do with this? I know you've read it. I think yeah. it's wonderful. And you'll make a motion to um, approve that. Okay. So we just need to approve the... Inspector. The annual report. Okay. Fred, do you want to make a motion? Sure. <laughs> I'll move that we, uh, I'll move to approve the annual report uh, of the Conservation Commission for, for 2020. We have a second. <laughs> I'll finish. I'll second that motion. Okay. <laughs> Dave Torrey gave a thumb up if you need a person for a second. <laughs> that works. All right. Um, all in favor? Jim Wilson, aye. Al Stone, aye. Al Finney, aye. Brad LaBurge, aye. David hey. has his thumb up. <laughs> Super. We miss you, Dave. <laughs> That's great. All right. Um, so next will be the 720, the 16 Valentine 16, Drive. 16 Valentine Drive? Yeah. Oh, which one? Okay. 720? Wow. 839. Do you have some maps with this, Richard? And what do you? No, we don't have any. Okay. Oh, where we stand now as far as, because last week, last month, we didn't have the report, but someone had gone out. Right. Um, oh, and I think, oh, yep, Zach's here. I don't know if Zach wants to speak. Sure. I've, I reached out to Joyce Hastings, and I still haven't heard back from her. Um, I'm not sure if she contacted conservation for any reason, but... I haven't heard anything back. Um, I followed up as late as this afternoon as well for a second time, and I haven't got the report back yet. Okay. Um, so as soon as you do get a report, if you could forward that to Amy, to um, Stephanie, Janet. <laughs> Absolutely. And then so that we can we can get the report ourselves and yeah. try to see where we need to go from there. Um, so. Um, you know, we've got, I think we've got the background pretty well as to, um, you know, to be straightforward, um, what happened on your property, um, looking at, um, you know, just a quick overview where, where it relates to on your property, any, um, any violations of, of wetlands. And then um, we'll need to look in Richard as to how that alter, alter alteration affected anything that that's happened since then and you know who's who's responsible and and from there so but we kind of need the soil report first so we can kind of get an idea of what's going on um and then we'll move from there with once we get that we'll have a better idea of where to move forward to um, i'll try to have it by your next meeting okay and then yeah, they, usually Janet. What do they need it ten days before the meeting to put on notice to put in public? Normally, we have a, a forty-eight hours, but okay, since yeah. it's already on. Yeah, the sooner the better. You know, gives time to people go through it, or if we need to go to the site or anything. That way, if we get it, um, and Janet has questions, it gives gives us some time for Janet to reach out to the person who wrote the report maybe get some more data um, 
some some more of um you know some topography of of that area and what you know the you know because someone was alleging that there were some basins that um there were some things that were done during construction of the homes in that street so um we just need to do some more research once we get the soil samples back find out if first you know our jurisdictional part and then where we go from there seem fair enough I know it's not an easy thing either way. So we're trying to, you know, do this as due diligence as we can, but um, takes a little while to get reports back sometime. And right now with the winter, that's not going to help us at all. So, okay. Does anybody in the board have a question? Anybody from the audience? Okay. Um, when we want to move this to Janet, what time would be a good time? Oh, the hand did pop up. What's that? The hand just did pop up. Okay. Um, I have Rachel Watsky. Yeah. Hi. Um, sorry about the delay in getting my hand up. I'm was going through technical difficulties, so I was using a different mechanism and had to figure out where the hand was on this one. Um, I'm representing the Gill bodies who are next door neighbors to uh, number 16. Um, we just would wanna request that any information that gets sent to the commission um, from Joyce get also sent to the, the next door neighbors. Yeah. That um, usually these will be on linked on our public record, Richard, okay. when we, yeah, when we, we have our next meeting, we can make that an attachment, the soil report. Yeah, we can provide that to the, yeah. Usually we try to keep, you know, maps and that type of stuff. We have us on added to our agendas on the, the town meeting part. Mm -hmm. And then if you ever do have a question, you, you can just email uh, Janet DeLongo, and she'll be more than happy to send you anything that she has or any questions that you have, feel free. <laughs> All right, thank you. Yeah, so that, that'll speed it up. You don't have to wait till next month to see what comes up. If you have a question or concern or like that, just email Janet. All right, anyone else? All right, so. What time, Janet, for the next? We have one at 710, one at 720. And we have seven o'clock with uh, MBTA. Maybe we want to get them in a little earlier so they don't know. I have a feeling Seekonk Street is probably going to run long next week. Do we want to do 705? Or do we have a seven o'clock? I have, I have 710, right, for 180? Yeah, we okay, could do 7 yeah. o'clock. And 7 o'clock is, is the MBTA. Oh, okay. Um, we can try 705. Yeah, why don't we do 705, and then that way we'll fit everybody in before we have um, the, next, the next meeting. Before we have, I'm sorry, before we have Seekonk again. So make a motion to continue 16 Valentine Drive enforcement order to 705 on 310. Someone want to make a motion? I will make a motion to continue this to the 10th at 705. Valstone second. Jim Wilson, I. Valstone, I. Al Finney, I. Fred LaBerge, I. David. <laughs> okay, and the motion passes. Um, Richard, we have something here for Hanover Street. Um, the, the lot, um, I don't see it on the agenda, but 
I don't know if they want to make, if anyone's here from Hanover Street. Yeah, it's, it is on there just below uh, Valentine Chase Drive there. Informal discussion. Okay. All right, yes. I mean, okay. So, yes. so Jim Nervous here from uh, Dunn McKenzie, and I'm going to put the plan up. So I'm sharing it right now so you can take a look at it. Jim, you want to? Okay. These are um, one Hanover and five Hanover Street. The, these these lots were sold at an auction by the town of Norfolk last month um, in the, in November. Um, they had per tests done in the you can see them in the front of the lots. Uh, with all the setbacks from from the street setbacks, it's a fifty foot setback on the street. And, you know, yeah, with the um, setbacks of the septic systems, we, the houses would have to go within the um, 50 foot buffer, 50, uh, 25 to 50 foot buffer. Um, and the grading, the grading would have to almost go to the wetlands within five feet of the wetlands. We're proposing a two rail fence at, around the edge of the grading um, as a buffer. Um, the lots are very, uh, they're very unforgiving. Um, you have, as soon as you go off the street, it slopes down. And, and like I said, <clears throat> You can see the two septic systems within the on the on the proposed lots. You know, you need ten feet off the street, the width of the septic system, and then after that, you need a um, a twenty five uh, a twenty foot buffer between the septic system and the uh, foundation. You know, and so this is what we came up with. And we would like that uh, your your opinion before we move forward, you know, because they're very tight lots. And it, like I said, the town sold these two lots to two of our clients, different clients. So we're just trying to get some input. Well, I think from my point of view, uh, the 25 foot would, is a no and uh, the 50 foot, I, I don't believe we've really allowed anyone to really operate a home in the 50 foot um, buffer. We've given some exceptions with the 50 to 100, um, but we haven't with in the 50 and 25 foot area. Um, mainly because it's not so much the effect on the wetlands, it's the effect on the animals that are in the wetlands, which in turn affects the wetlands. And that's why we have those pretty strict buffers. I understand that though, but like I said, then the town should have never brought these to auction because they could not be developed in a, with all the building offsets that the town requires, you know, I mean, um, there's not enough land between the street and the 25 foot buffer to put a house in a septic system in a well within that, when those, within those lots. I mean, they're the ones who, who did the perks. We didn't, you know, they said it was a, a viable lot. So we're trying to do our best to get this through. Yeah. Um, Jim, if I might, because yeah. I've been kind of involved with discussions on these for a while. Um, when it originally started, it was brought up about the, you know, the zero to 50 do not disturb local. And 
it was basically get it up on a plan, you know, where you do the modest house, the septic, the driveway, the basic necessities there, um, you know, and, and maybe protecting the rest of the lot and, and run it by conservation to see how they feel. I was a little surprised slash disappointed to see this where the house on the number five, it's this big, long four bedroom house. They've got the deck out back, which it goes right into that 50 foot. They got room to move that on the side. Um, you know, even, and I guess too, I don't think they, I think they've got to go back and do, I'm not a board of health person. Um, I have sewer, but I think they have to go back and do the high groundwater test just to make sure that's okay. I don't know if you reduce bedrooms, if you've got a smaller septic, you know, the idea is, I think work could be done to make this a little bit more appealing, at least to me. I just, um, especially the deck, there's no reason to have that sitting out back there. I just, I mean, <laughs> supposed to try to do the reduce, make it more to see what you could fit in there. And this just, this is like somebody's major wish list to me. Um, even the one on the other side, I think that's a four bedroom but it's a lot smaller. The whole thing is a lot tighter design on that. So, because, oh, okay. Yeah. I see so many problems. Where do you start? Your well has to be 100 feet from your septic system. You that's got right. Two, you got and two I wells got, you got to go in there. As, that's correct. I have a well out back, almost. In the in wetland. The, I'm a, right. And then I, I mean, the lots are not viable lots, in, the, in my opinion. But I can't. I you know I was hired to 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 see if we could get something through. I mean, you know those those are the test holes that they did in October, and they 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 sold them as as viable lots, and they said, you know. It would sustain a four-bedroom house. I, I, you know. What do we do to protect the wetlands from the owners of putting sheds or, or filling it in once they purchase it? On top of that, they're already sitting in the wetland. So it's. I mean, I just see so many negatives with these two lots. Right. I, and nothing. I'm not nothing against you, Jim. I know what you're doing. Your job. I, I believe that, but. You're trying to fit something in a shoebox here, and it doesn't look like really happening. I un I understand that, you know, and why the town uh, would sell it, no. I don't know. No, I, mean, I don't know, Rich. If if it's possible to merge the two lots and get a variance to put the house closer than fifty feet, so we're out of the wetlands. That would be, you could have the well on one side and the and the um, septic on the other. Septic on the other and the house in the middle. With a, two uh, separate owners. What's that? Two, two separate, separate owners. Oh, well, that won't There's not one developer. It's, oh. it's two separate owners at this point. They sold them two separately. And there's a 50 foot setback off the roadway. But like I said, with the septic system being a 10 foot offset and then with the width of your septic system and then a 25, a 20 foot um, setback to your foundation, you know, it pushes you back yeah. that far. You know, we also did a study along that roadway to see if we could go maybe to the planning board and see if we can, you know, and ask for variances to bring the houses forward but that really wouldn't do it because of where the septics have to be and the size of the septics have to be that way, you know? Well, I guess the question, so the, the, the test pits, the test holes on there, those were from the- Those were done by um, a gentleman in Medway or Medfield for the town of Norfolk. So they could sell these lots. 
Okay. They were done in October. In those leaching fields or whatever, can that be turned this way? I mean, did they have to be horizontal to the road? I, I don't know. I mean, you, where would you, I, you know, I have tried it. If you turn it 90 degrees, we, you know, you, you don't have the room to go. Um, Backwards, to it'd, be in the wetlands, it'd, be in, it'd be in the 25 foot buffer. That's Whoa. correct. Yes. I, mean, I don't understand. I, I mean, I'm not the designer here, but there are four bedrooms also. I mean, a two bedroom would might be, be less septic, but four bedroom, that's big houses. Well, you can't design a four bed, a two bedroom within the state of Mass. No. Has, no. Okay. You have to design it for at least a three bedroom. Well, um, I guess you know, the, so. I guess the, just a general question: if you if you were to look for another location on the lot for the septic system that could perk, could could the house be relocated so that it, you could get it out of the, at least pull it even further out of the buffer zone? I mean, I know you're basing the design off of this, these perks, but could it be perked in another location to have? The the um the building setback um is a fifty foot setback off the roadway. I mean that's that's a large setback. You know, you look at you're looking at a at least um a ten foot setback from the roadway, a twenty foot a twenty foot setback from the foundation and, and you're trying to put a septic system within that area. Plus, Richard, he's got a neighbor's well to the left of the map here, and yeah. that's running the 100-foot well marker is running like halfway through his house on that left-hand lot. Right. Yeah, I see Along with the 50-foot barrier, the whole house is in the 50, 25 to 50. Yeah. Even part of it's in the 15 to 25. So if you look at the 50 foot buffer on on number one Hanover, that is almost at the 50 foot, that's almost at the building front setback line. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's not real clear. And, you know, I don't want to speak for anyone else, but if, if you're, 100 foot buffer is running mm -hmm. along the street and you have to go 50 feet back, you're automatically in the 50 foot buffer mark. Yeah. yeah. But I, but I yeah. don't think these wetlands were delineated prior to the auction, right? No. Right, they were, they were on the uh, state website, you know, but you know, Enough that said. doesn't- Enough said. Right. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Not to mention we got we got cams on the other side that we've been making sure they stay out of the wetlands yeah. as well. And now we're gonna allow this possibly. I'm just I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I mean we tried, you know, even if we do a smaller house, you know, that house is only at 30 foot depth. On on um on number one on lot number one, that's only thirty feet wide, you know, and we're going up with it. As it is now, they're not going to have a yard anyways. So you know, you get walls and that's my concern. Green. They're not going to have a yard, but they will make one eventually. I, I know. You know. Yes. I, yeah, that, yeah, number one is, is completely in, even if you built up the street, you're in the 50 to 100 foot buffer zone. Completely. Because there's, there's no spot to put, you've lost half the property for septic and well to the 100 foot neighbor's well. And then you got to deal with number two lot that's got it's going to have the same issues rep represented trying to get a well 
and it's forcing you well into the wetlands. Mm. So I, short of Allen running water and sewer down your street, that would, I mean, I don't know how close public water is to Hanover Street in this it's spot. It's all the way back to George Street. It's miles. It's a couple, a mile and a half at least. Okay. So and there's nothing in the works? Because no. that would help in this situation, not having to deal with private water. Camjo was, look, was looking at bringing the main down, but the, the expense was far too much. So that didn't happen. Yeah. So Jim, what you said initially, we've never allowed construction of a home within the 100 foot, uh, I mean the 50 foot buffer, Never mind the 25 and both of these properties look like they would be pushing that. So right. You'd have to have the house on the street. So yeah. It, it, built on top of the septic. Yes. Right. Yeah. In order to in order to meet even the the lot one in order to meet the 50 foot standard. I mean, if you're asking us if this if there's a workaround, that this just appears to me to be undoable. Yeah. Yeah. It's because obvious it shouldn't have been sold, to be honest with you. It shouldn't have yeah. been. No, it's well, I can put it back up. I think you kind of reached the the conclusion. Why we came to you before we uh went any, any further to in filing, you know and get your comments on this because yeah. um, we saw a number of hurdles to try to get through on this. No, that's a smart way to do it, especially yeah. when, then you, you get to determine where your house is gonna be and septic and water from there based on the wetland flag, so. It seems like you've uh, arrived at your answer. Yeah. Thank you. Put that um, hand up. Dave Matthew. Dave Matthew. Hi. Um, yeah, so I am the owner of uh, One Hanover. Um, and we and my partner, um, Rob, is also on the uh, call here. Um, we would be willing to go with something smaller. Um, what we were advised to do is put up what the septic would um, or what the perk test would support. And then from there, have a discussion with you about how much smaller we needed to go. So it was not necessarily, I mean, our, our wish would be, yes, you guys said yay before bedroom house in the wetlands, but that wasn't our expectation. Um, and as Jim said, you can't build a, um, a three bedroom or a two bedroom septic. So it would be based on a three bedroom, but we could certainly go with a much smaller three bedroom house that would be um, it probably, it would probably still be about 25 feet deep and maybe about 45 feet wide. Um, I don't know if that makes any difference to you. Um, it might be able to stay all within the 50 foot buffer zone at that point and not encroach into the 25. Um, we are proposing a, a two rail fence that would keep people out of the wetlands. They would have to actually take down a fence to put, to, to, put their shed in the wetland area. Um, if that needed to be a little bit farther away from the wetlands, we would also consider that. Um, you know, so we, we're open to hearing um, comments and, and Jim could you know, make some changes to this based on your comments. Yeah, unfortunately, anything beyond the 50 foot is a no-go for the, the board, even as a minimum. And the 50 to 100 is kind of a stretch. What are your thoughts, Janet? So, oh, who asked? Oh, um, no, I'm just, forgive me, because I'm trying to get the existing elevations because they're showing a basement and everything. And there was a house on Annalore where they ended up having it as a, you know, the, the house was a walkout just to drop everything down. You know, it could, and I don't know how much it makes a difference. You can switch that over further to the right. 
to hit the building setback line. You know, I don't know how much playing you could do to see if you can reduce stuff. The, the existing, um, oh, I'm sorry, the existing grade in the back of the house now is elevation 148, okay? Um, we're proposing a basement foundation of 155. That 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 lot needs to be filled big time. Um, yeah, a big time. A lot of fill because of, of where the water table is, according to the perk test. The water table on the perk test is like 46 inches down. So you're almost putting your septic system on the ground level at that point. And then you have to build up from there. You know, um, the, you know, Janet, you've, you've been out to see this, I assume. No. Nope. Well, I'm very familiar with these two lots and you're talking a tremendous amount of fill is going to have to come in to make these lots work. Mm -hmm. And it's going to have to be pitched to the wetlands. And I would eventually, I would venture to say you have to bring a lot of fill and put it in the 50 and the 25 foot buffer. Am I correct, Jim, to say that? Yes. Yes. Because if you look, if you look okay. at, like I, like I just said to you, um, with a, with a nine foot foundation, your basement floor is 155 and you have an existing grade of 152 in the front and 148 on the back. So you, you need to fill in at least four feet before you can um, have your basement floor, you know? Um, I mean, I, I don't, Mr. Matthews, don't get me wrong. I don't want to sound like the bad guy here. I'm just, I'm just relaying the facts to my co conspirators here. On this. No, I understand. Uh, you know, because I know this land very well. And, um, you know, we, we yeah, I can see a lot of fill going in the 25 foot buffer. And that's the reason we have these there is to prevent that. And, uh, you know, I just don't see this happening really, in my opinion. Yeah, unfortunately, we, you know, I can't speak for everyone. They vote based, but we, we, we don't approve anything in the 50 foot and less buffer, even including a fence or a well or anything. So nothing in that 50 foot barrier. So I don't know with setbacks and stuff like that, if you can go back to the town, um, I, I don't know what you can do, but it can't be anything within the 50 foot as a minimum. Okay, because the you know the town sold it as um, just requiring a filing, not conservation approval, um, which the other three lots or four lots that they sold, they described as needing conservation approval. But these two, they said uh, just needed a filing, which would be more like just a notice of intent and um, that it would be um, that it would work. So um, okay, so I guess we're gonna end up having to go back to the town. So you you're not willing to hear with with a smaller house footprint or anything like that. Um, it just needs to be in front of the 50 foot buffer, buffer zone. Well, what you were sold was you need a 50 foot barrier, a 50 foot frontage variance. And the 50 foot marker is 50 feet from the street. So there's virtually no place to put a builder. Right. You're in variation of the conservation ordinance for wetlands and you're in if you put your house closer you're in violation of um, the setback ordinance so I don't know why it would it's not a buildable lot from our point of view uh, you know unfortunately we can't say whether you get a variance or you know what the why there's a setback and and you know the board of health with where you're um, septic and wells go. Ours is just nothing beyond 
the 50 foot mark. The, so. There may have been a shot if they were two combined lots, but being two, I mean, one combined lot may, yeah. may have a chance at that, but yeah, two, well, I don't yeah. see it happening. I, I don't with, see a chance there. Even with both lots combined, staying within the 50 foot mark, you'd have to have a variance to put the houses in because you'd have to have the septic in one lot and the house in the other. Mm. And the house looks like it would barely fit in two. You'd have to make a smaller house to go into. Yes, that's... And you'd have to have the septic in probably one and the well in two. Yes. In order for it to work. Okay, and um, you don't, you guys don't allow a the septic in the 50 foot zone? No. Okay. We came to you before we did a uh, notice of intent. Um, thank you for your time. Well, thank Anything? You for your I'm glad you came here first before you spent the money on design and build. Yeah. Oh. Else, Dave? Um, no, I'm good. Thank you. All right. So um, I don't believe we need to close this because this was just an informational type of correspondence. Correct. Okay. Um, does anybody else have any comments on it? Or are we pretty much in agreement? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I'm going downstairs. I think that's it, Richard, unless there's somebody out there that came with something. I think uh, I think it's a wrap for tonight. That's a wrap? Yep. All right. So just need uh, someone to make a motion to adjourn the meeting. So moved. Who is that? Fred. Seconded. That's Fred, right. Second? Alan Finney seconded. All in favor? Hi. 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 <laughs> Hi. David, Good night, thumbs up. Thank you. Good night.